Well, welcome. I uh, love the series that we've been in. My name is Calvin, one of the pastors here. The series of Daniel, book in the Bible. And uh, I think Netflix, you like Netflix? You watch Netflix? I think a lot of people do. Uh, I think Netflix needs to do a series on Daniel. It's an epic story. I love the, the Bible is filled with so many cool stories. If you you haven't gone through the Old Testament, there's so many more, and I invite you to, to check those out. We, we've been looking at the story of Daniel, and, and we've really been focusing on this, this one phrase uh, that goes like this, how to live for God in a hostile environment. How can we live for God in a hostile environment? And, and to learn this tension, we've been looking at the life of Daniel, and we've been looking at how, how can we live in a way where we're not influenced by the world, and not just to be a hermit where we hide away. Some people think, I'm just going to stay away from all that bad stuff. I'm not going to let my kids be influenced by the bad stuff. You, you have to be in the world. So if you're not going to be influenced by things that happen, what can you do? And as we look at the tension of Daniel and his life, we, we've been looking at the, the other side of the coin, which is how to be an influence for God, for the kingdom. And in this series, we, we've been looking at Daniel's life and we've been seeing that, that this tension that we live in is, is difficult, but it's always been there. Since the Garden of Eden, when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, there's always been this tension of being in the world, but not being influenced and living like the people of the world. And this is what we teach our kids, right? In good Christian families, we say, how to live a life that, that God would be excited about that God would be happy for, and and you teach it, and then you have to live the life yourself. It's one of the the hardest things as a pastor is to preach it from stage and and realize you got to live it in your life too. You ever hear a message or or a a statement from someone and like, oh, that sounds really good, and then it sinks in for a second, you're like, oh, no, i got to change a few things. I feel like that happens, and God convicts me often. And so in this series, we've been looking at Daniel and how he was a prisoner of war, a human, uh, human trafficked from a long way away by a conquering nation. God's people had all these warnings and they didn't heed them. God was like, worship me, love me. And, and they said, well, what about this stuff over here? And God said, no, 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 don't do that. But they continued to do it. He gave them warnings after warnings. And eventually God removed his protection from his people. And the Babylonians came in, conquered, took them all with them. It was terrible. And there was this this faithful remnant that survived. Daniel, his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and and a faithful remnant. Because no matter how bad the world gets, God will never let his people disappear from the earth. There may be a few. There's not going to be a a big megachurch filled with all these Christians at different points in history. But there'll never be no one. Because God is sovereign. His witness is will be proclaimed through his people throughout all time. And I love that. And it reminds me that no matter how bad the world gets, God is still there. Isn't that reassuring? I love that. And through this series, we've been able to see how Daniel, he lived differently. And because of that, he became an influence in the kingdom that he lived in. King Nebuchadnezzar, remember the guy that we've been talking about? This big, bad king, tyrant king, and... And he has all these dreams and Daniel shares God's words and wisdom with him. And the king's like, oh, that God sounds like a good guy. He's one of the gods. I like that God. And then goes on to live the way he wants to live. But we heard last week that finally God had changed Nebuchadnezzar's heart. He had repented and he had followed after God. And it was amazing. Between chapters four and five, last week and this week, about 40 years passed. So it wasn't like it, it was straight from one chapter to the next. Forty years had passed. Daniel, he, he was about 30, 40 years old in chapter 4. And now he, he's 80-ish years old. And he's not in leadership anymore. Now, I don't know whether he retired and he's like, all right, living the retired life, I'm out. Or whether King Belshazzar, the new king, didn't have him in leadership. Because quite often, when God's people are living a faithful life, the leaders of our world don't, don't really want them to have influence anymore. They kind of brush him aside, right? So Daniel, he's not in leadership anymore. King Nebuchadnezzar, who had finally become a, a God follower, submitted to God, the kingdom followed suit. He'd been dead 22 years and quickly the Babylonian kingdom started going a different direction. King Belshazzar was like, yep, no, nope, I'm not into that whole God stuff. 
I got all these other gods that I want to spend some time exploring. And we see that this new king was on the throne and uh, he was probably either Nebuchadnezzar's son or grandson. They use the same word in the original language for son and grandson. So we're not really sure what part of uh, his uh, family he was in compared to Nebuchadnezzar. But God had had given so many opportunities for Belshazzar to, to know about him. He had witnessed how God had worked through Daniel in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. And he'd seen that the Nebuchadnezzar had built this big statue that everyone had to bow down to. And Daniel had predicted, his, had, uh, interpreted the, predicted and interpreted the dream that he heard how the Babylonian Empire was going to be destroyed. He witnessed and heard about the stories of how Nebuchadnezzar got so mad that he threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace and they walked out unscathed. Isn't it interesting how people can witness miracles from God and still not believe in him? gets me. They see all this amazing thing that God does, not only in, in our world, but in the lives of the people they love. They witness people in their family get converted, become Christians, Jesus followers, people they love, they trust, that they know, and yet it still doesn't have an impact on their lives. This, this is the truth that just being around Christians doesn't make you a Christian. Just because your family is a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. There is a choice that you personally have to make. God had had given Belshazzar so many chances. He's long-suffering. And and yet he had chosen to go a different direction. How many prayers of believers have been spent praying for their loved ones to make that decision? And yet they don't always come true. This is the hard truth about life. We, we don't live in a Hallmark movie. It's not always a happy ending. There's decisions, consequences, and choices. Sometimes people think uh, everything will end up great no matter what you do. Don't worry about it. Everybody's going to heaven and it's going to be great. And you'll see everyone you've ever loved up in heaven because God is love. Well, we define love at our church as truth and grace. The truth is it doesn't always end up a happy ending unless you choose God's love, Jesus. This is uh, what we're going to be talking about today, and it's a heavy topic, but, but the topic is death. Have you ever thought about what happens when you die? In verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles. He drank wine with them. Belshazzar, while he was drinking wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets, that King Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets and they had, that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone." The context of what's going on right now is uh, we, we know this from historians, not just from scripture, but from other historical sources, that the Persian Empire was conquering the Babylonian armies. And right now they're marching towards King Belshazzar and uh, his, his time was coming to an end. And so this is really the question. What would you do if you only knew you had a couple of days to live? What would you do? Have you ever thought about that before? Unfortunately for some, they've had bad diagnoses and, and they've had to come to terms with that question. What did these guys do? Well, let me show you this. They partied. He threw a rager. King Belshazzar was like, all right, we're going to die. Let's have a party. They drank wine. You notice it says that uh, the king's wives were there. Okay, it makes sense. The king's having a party and... He invites his wives, that's great. But, but then it goes on to say, he also invited his concubines. So his wives are there and his concubines are there. Why, why are concubines there? What are they? they weren't normally at these parties. Well, unfortunately for this party, it, it had a very immoral twist to it. And what was happening is the concubines were invited and all these dignitaries, all these rich, wealthy, famous, all these, these people in power. He's like, hey, I got these concubines. You do what you want to do. Have fun. Some parties are so immoral. Terrible. This party was 
was what they thought going to be a party for the ages, one that they were going to love, enjoy, and uh, it was a great distraction for them, is what they thought, right? Their death, their end is marching towards them, so they're living distracted. Now, how many people today choose to live life distracted? Drink and be merry, right? YOLO, you only live once, live it up. Invest in the here and now because that's all you have. Your bucket list, have you done every item on your bucket list? You need to. Do you not have one? Well, you should create one. That's how we think the here and now, to enjoy it, to live and be merry, to, to get drunk, to do whatever your desires. Fulfill them. That's what was going on. But have you thought about what happens when you die? It's a heavy topic, right? Welcome to church. <laughs> what a Sunday. The distraction, though, it didn't just move. It, it didn't just stay in the party, in the, the distraction realm. It, it went even worse. We have a long-suffering God, but, but eventually God says enough is enough. And God had been long-suffering with Belshazzar, and, and eventually what happened was that distraction soon moved into sacrilege. Well, ha- well, what happened? What does that mean? Well, the, the things that had been set aside for worship to God in the temple, the things that, that were only to be used by the priest in the, the ceremonial worship, the king's like, all right, that God, uh, slap him in the face, bring in all his special stuff, and we're going to enjoy it. That's what they did. They partied with the, uh, the special china. You, get, you guys have special china that you only use on holidays? Um, uh, I, uh, we, I don't know if that's a generational thing, but uh, we got, for our wedding, we got given some uh, Waterford crystal. Beautiful from Ireland, and uh, we love it. Uh, we've used it once, actually. Because it's beautiful and lovely, and we're nervous, we're going to break it. You know, it's crystal, it's nice, and it's special. And, but this stuff was set, up, set aside, not just because it looked good. It did. Gold. But because it was meant for something special. And yet they desecrated it. And so we read here that, that this doesn't phase God. God. God is God regardless of what you do. You can't destroy God. And, and Psalm 2 verse 4, I love this verse. It says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. When people start to do stuff like that, slap God in the face, do whatever gestures they want to do towards God, God sits there and, and he just laughs at them. He's like, you, you don't know what you're doing. I'm God. But God is long-suffering in, in Belshazzar. His time was coming to an end. He, he'd gone too far. He had the choices. He had the opportunities. And God shows up. Verse 5, Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and his, he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Now, in the parties, obviously, they didn't have electricity. They weren't in this, this big mansion building. They, they had this head table where the king would sit, and it was well lit with lanterns, and behind it was a white plastered wall. And all of a sudden, this severed hand appears at the party. Now, you can just imagine it, right? Hey, John, uh, did I drink too much, or is that a severed hand scratching in that wall? You just imagine that the thoughts that were going on in their, in their minds, and and they're wondering, uh, how much have we been drinking? This is a crazy party. But they soon sobered up. There's moments when God shows up. There's moments when we have to address the, the craziness in life where it turns from laughter, turns from debauchery into panic and fear. Things go silent. Like when the, the cops show up to a high school house party, things change. God shows up. He shuts it down. Now in here we see that it says the king his face turned pale. He was frightened. Now, I would be frightened if I saw a severed hand scratching words into a wall. That alone would, would frighten me. Yet, we see what he's going to say about what is going to be written in a moment. It says here, this is a nice version. It says, his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Um, the, the more literal translation, instead of his knees and his legs, it means his bowels became weak. We get, are we getting there yet? <laughs> he pooped himself. He was so frightened, he's lost control of his bowels. 
I've never been that frightened in my life. I can't imagine what that would have been like. He's gone from ecstasy, debauchery, the, the highs of a big party, living, being married, to the reality of the consequences of his actions. God, he showed up. And so he's petrified. He calls for his experts to come in and his, his experts come in and, and they're like, we got nothing. And anytime the people who are the experts don't know what to say, that's when you get even more afraid, right? You're supposed to know the answers and you don't know the answers. Well, well who does? And, and so he's afraid. And then the queen comes in. Now, this isn't his, his wife. We're not sure if this is his mom or his grandmother, or it could be. There was two kings at that time. It could be the other king's wife. But no matter who it was, they had a position of authority where they could just walk into the party on their own authority. And so she walks in and, and she says to the king, hey, uh, there's this guy, his name's Daniel. Remember Daniel? She says that, that he has the spirit of the holy gods in him. You should talk to him. And so we see here that Daniel comes in and, and the king offers Daniel, like he has throughout the ages, gifts if he can do what he wants him to do. And this is one of my favorite verses in this whole story. Because Daniel shows up in a mighty way right here. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. What a great example Daniel is right here of what we've been talking about. Because Daniel said, I'm not going to be influenced by you. I can't be bought. I can't be rewarded to be a yes man like all these other uh, professional phonies that you have. The ones that can't tell you what those, the writing means. You can't buy me. Daniel's like, you've, you've got this backwards. I have something that you need. You don't have anything that I need. And this is so true for us today that we should not let ourselves be swayed by the, the, the temptation of material things. It's tough, though. We, we have God's truths, his promises, and, and he's calling us to be faithful like Daniel. And yet you get tempted, and you're like, well, I can compromise a little bit. I mean, who wouldn't for $2 million? If God wanted you to have $2 million, he would give you $2 million. We start to see this, and, and Daniel is faithful. He's courageous. He, he's older now. He's 80 years old. And, and the great thing that I've experienced about old people is that when they get to that age, they don't care. They're like, okay, what's, what are you going to do? He's courageous. He's seen it all before. God has showed up and God has been faithful to him. And Daniel is faithful. And this is the truth. God doesn't need us to do his work, but he wants us to be co-workers in his mission. Because he knows that he will be glorified through us living faithfully. That through our faithful living, we will be a witness to other people to God's glory. This is such a great testament. Daniel is such a great example of how to live in, in the world and be an influence for God rather than being influenced by God. He couldn't be bought. There's so many yes men standing in front of the king because they were scared about what would happen to themselves. Not Daniel. Because he had the assurance. He knew. He wasn't living for the here and now, drinking and being merry. And he knew what was going to happen after his death. And he lived like eternity was on the line. He wanted people to know who God was. In his pride, Belshazzar didn't change. And then it was too late. Verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, Daniel says, have not humbled yourself though you knew all of this. Stop there for a second. See this thing pride coming up again? Humbleness and being proud. Pride is one of the biggest obstacles for people coming to Jesus. Belshazzar had all these different opportunities and he chose not to. Verse 23, instead you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Be careful when you do that. There's only one winner out of that one. You had the goblets and the, uh, from the temple brought them to you and you, you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of gold, of silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life in all your ways. Therefore, anytime you read therefore in the Bible, say this, um, that what, is theref what is therefore, therefore? Because it's an important word. Therefore, 
he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Three words that brought so much fear into his life. Not just the severed hand, but the writing and what it was going to be interpreted to mean. Mene means numbered. The days of this kingdom have been numbered and they are spent like money. He's about to come to an end. Tekel means measured. God is comparing the king to God's standard of justice and goodness. And like all of us, it falls short. And then Parson. The kingdom is going to be torn apart and given to Persia. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. Verse 26, mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. I got this alarm clock here. You guys ever remember these? We got phones now. Anybody use one of these? Some people, right? You, you, this represents, sig, uh, signifies moments of our life. Now, the thing with an alarm clock is you set the alarm clock to go off when you want it to go off. Like that's what it's meant for, right? It tells time, but you get to have some control of when things happen. Um, You set it when you want to wake up. Anybody not woken up to their alarm before? Anybody woken up before their alarm? We we, we start to set the alarm to when we want to wake up. and, and, And we think that obviously I can't have control of when I was born. But after that, I'm going to control my life. You know, I'm going to go to college and when I graduate, I want to work at this company. And so you set the alarm and start doing that. And I want to get married. I'm going to be married at this age. And then I'm going to have kids and I want to have kids by the time I'm this age. And then I'll have the second one, the third one. Or I'm not going to have kids. I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to do this. And, and you start to kind of set up all the different things in your life and the timeline that you want to accomplish it by. Now, goals aren't bad. I'd encourage you have goals. But the truth is, how many of you really think you have control of when things happen. Sometimes. But honestly, the only one that truly has control of of things in our life uh, is God. We don't have control over every element of our life when it comes to time. It's the only thing that we can't get more of. And this is the, the inevitable truth that one day, all of us will be out of time. You can control a lot, of in your, a lot in your life, but God knows how much time you have. And for this king, for Belshazzar, he knew the stories of King Nebuchadnezzar. He knew the dreams. He knew the interpretations. He knew all of this, but he lived as if he was in control and the here and now mattered. Nothing else. And God, he's had enough. Here's the sobering truth. Our days are numbered. One day the alarm is going to ring for the last time. And we don't know when that is. And for many of us, it, it kind of makes us a little nervous and scared, right? You, you're like, I, I don't want to die, and I, I don't want to die either. But God, ultimately, he knows what's going to happen. Our days are numbered. And one day, the, the bell will ring, and it will toll. And we'll say, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, as the famous quote goes. And that'll be the day of our death. It's coming. Spurgeon, a famous theologian and pastor, says this, He who does not prepare for death is more than an ordinary fool. He is a (laughs) madman. He puts it in such a simple way. But this is the truth. When you ask the question, have you thought about what happens when you die? Most people don't want to think about it. They want to live distracted. They want to enjoy life, drink and be merry and and put their head in the sand and say, ah, I'll get there one day. One day I'll think about that when I'm older, when when, when I've got to worry about that kind of stuff. And you don't think that that day could be today. You don't think that that day could be next week. You think it's, oh, it's way, 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 way down the road. But we just don't know. Our days are numbered. I, uh, um, Got married a number of years ago, and we got married in Newburyport, Massachusetts, and uh, um, my wife's in, in, in the audience, I don't know if I've told her this story. So we, uh, it's the night before the wedding, and uh, we have the rehearsal dinner, and uh, I packed all my stuff, and we were living in Manchester, so a good 45 minutes, an hour drive, and, and I'm getting ready in the afternoon, and, and I put on my clothes, and I ironed my shirt. Yes, it's a big day. You've got to iron your shirt. So I ironed my shirt, and as I put it on, I noticed that there was a big stain on my shirt. Yikes. It's going to be photos. It's 
going to be people. I got to look good. And so I'm like, ah. and for me, I'm, I'm not the guy that packs an alternative shirt for, the, for my outfit. So I didn't have another shirt to put on. And so I was like, oh, I'm in New Report. There's stores in New Report. Nice stores. I'm going to go buy a new shirt. I forgot that uh, I can't afford the stores in New Report. <laughs> Uh, well, at least they were expensive. And so we, we start looking around and, and, and the clock's going. And I'm, I'm like, oh no, I'm not going to be ready. And, and I went around the stores. I couldn't find a shirt that worked, that fit, that, that was in my price range. I was like, nah, forget about it. There's a lot of money being spent. Just buy a shirt. Don't worry about the money. And, and, and then I still couldn't find one. And, and eventually I thought about it. I was like, you know, I'm going to get married tomorrow. Who cares? So I wore the shirt, had a big stain on it. Nobody said anything. And it was great. If you knew that your days were numbered and you only had a couple left to live, you wouldn't worry about the stain on your shirt, would you? What are you worrying about today that is so insignificant that is taking you away from who Jesus is calling you to be? Our days are numbered. We don't know and we want to live not just for the here and now. You do need to be smart and wise, absolutely. God wants you to be an influence in our world and and to share his love with people. However, we need to, to, to live for eternity, to be investing in that. Psalm 90, verse 12 says this, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to be aware of the clock that is our life so that we don't live for today, live for the debauchery of this world, live for all the, the sinful desires of our heart, but that we live in the wisdom of who God has called us to be an influence for the kingdom in our world. If our days are numbered, we need to live with an eternal focus. But I'd hazard a guess to say, too many of us, too many people in our world are just partying like a madman, not thinking about the day where it rings for the last time. Then in verse 27, Daniel, he explains the word tekel. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and been found wanting. Got my little scales right here. You ever seen one of these? Look at this. Oh. Here's the thing about scales. Um, when it comes to our faith and, and our life with Jesus, quite often we view it less as, as scales and more, more of a, uh, a bank account, like a checking account, where we're like, all right, so kind of living on the edge and... and and uh, I'm trying to be a, a, a good person. I'm trying to do good stuff. And, and then you do something that you're like, oh, no, that was terrible. And your uh, bank account goes into the, uh, the negative, the overdraft. You ever had one of those? And you're like, oh, I can't be in the overdraft. What if I died today? If I die in the negative, then uh, I'm going to the bad place. And quite often we think that if I do good, enough good things, then eventually it'll outweigh the bad things and it'll be even. And, and when I die, God will look at my, my balance sheet and say, well done, good and even balance sheet person. Oh, amen. And we think that when we do something bad, and I think actually even as Christians, sometimes we fall into this. Oh, I need to do enough good things to outweigh the bad. Oh, I looked at that on the computer again. I have to go volunteer at church. I have to be there on a Sunday. I have to, to, to be good with God. Oh, I was mean or I, I, I cussed when I was putting up that picture frame on the wall. Oh, no, I got, I got to do something else. Let me donate some money to a charity. Let me help. Let me pay it forward at Starbucks. Oh, if I do enough good things, me and the big guy, come on in, buddy. It's just not the gospel. It's not God's truth. We think it's loving But love is truth and grace. If you just have grace with no truth, man, you're not being loving to someone. You're just placating them, making it sound like everything's good. But the truth is, it's not all good. We think, how how is that fair? How is it fair that, that God allows my good family member to go to hell when they're, they're way better than that murderer. They're way better than the guy that did that genocide. How on earth can they both go to the same place? Ah, that's not fair. They're good. Well, there's only one good person that's ever lived. Because this is the thing with the scales. It, it, it's not like your good, your best can ever weigh enough 
to God's expectation of what it should be. Nobody can do that. The reality is, at best, we'll never measure up. Why? Because sin is heavy. As soon as you sin, live in sin, our world is in the sin. That happens. You might as well just knock it over, actually. Because this is the reality. It doesn't matter at that point because your sin is so heavy. The debt is so much that you can never do enough good to pay your own debt off. There's a phrase in New England that I love and most people in the, the country don't use it or don't quite understand what it means and it's, I'm all set. You ever heard that phrase? I used that the other day somewhere and I'm like, well, okay, what does that mean? You're all set? What, what is when, when you finally get to heaven or judgment, when, when you finally get to judgment, because everybody's going to be judged, tackle, you're going to be weighed, and, and for the king, he was found wanting. But, but when you get to that moment where, where your alarm goes off, God's there, you're being judged, or your actions, your thoughts, your deeds, everything is on the table, the good, the bad, the ugly. I want to look at God and say, I'm all set, because I know this guy, Jesus. Jesus, he said he paid it ahead. He tipped the scales in my favor. I'm all set. Now, I don't think it'll be as cavalier as that. I think I'll be so prostrate down on the floor in, in worship of God because he is so immense and amazing and, and heaven will be so different than that. But in my mind, it, that's how I prepare for it because I know that because of Jesus, when I'm weighed, I won't be found wanting because he lived a perfect life. When when we think about what we do in our lives, our best will never measure up. And I love what one pastor said. He said, you don't have to choose a different road to go to hell. You just have to stay on the road you're on long enough. The road of life is the narrow way. And you have to choose to get off the broad way that leads to hell, that leads to death, to follow Jesus and make a personal decision to say, Jesus, I know that what I've done is wrong. I know that how I've lived is wrong. And I want to repent You are my Lord, my Savior. Please forgive me. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Charles Spurgeon says this, there is enough tinder in the heart of the best men to light a fire that shall burn to the lowest hell unless God shall quench the sparks as they fall. It is only by God's grace and his mercy that when we await through Jesus We'll be all set. Do you know him? Has he paid your debt? Just ask. God is just. Payment must be paid. But he's also love. And Jesus says, I'll make that payment for you. He died on the cross so that you could have life. This is the good news that we share with people that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Because Romans 3.24 says, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption of that came by Christ Jesus. This is the opportunity. You don't have to just live for the here and now. One day, a day will come when the alarm sounds for the last time. Will you be ready? Will you be prepared when you're being weighed to say, I know a guy and his name is Jesus. Verse 28 says, Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Literally, this happened for King Belshazzar. The Medes and the Persians, they they conquered Babylon. It got divided up and and it got given away. And and when you think about the end of your life and, and what you leave, your legacy, well, this guy, his legacy was through a great party and then was obliterated. That's it. That was his legacy. When you think about what you're leaving behind, your money, your wealth, your stuff, your achievements, it's going to be divided and it's going to go to the taxes, the government, it's going to go to the lawyers because your family are going to squabble over what they get and then what's little is left will go to your loved ones. And then in the end of time, it's all destroyed. What will your legacy be? You can't take anything with you into eternity. After Jesus died on the cross, I, I love the example right here of divided Even the the only material things that Jesus had, his clothes, were divided, cast lots and divided between the soldiers. Material things don't matter. Are you living for the here and now? Or can you confidently say, I know where I'm going for eternity. Can you confidently pray for your friends, for your family, that God's love will come into him and they'll know that he is just, but there's another way. 
the way of Jesus. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. Don't delay. We don't know when our last day will be. If you're sitting here today and you're you're thinking, I'm terrified of death. I I don't want to die. I don't want to die today either. I don't have a desire to do that, but I do want to spend eternity with Jesus. I don't have to be afraid because I know where I'm going. That can be your story too. I invite you to pray today a prayer of forgiveness, a prayer of repentance, asking God to forgive you and to lead you in the way of his son, Jesus. I'd love to talk to you if you're wrestling through that, if you're ready to make that decision to get baptized and say yes to Jesus. God is giving you another chance right now. Will you take it? Let's pray. God, we ask, Lord, that you would be with each of us as we go through this life, that you would give us the, the assurances that we have in your son, Jesus, that we would live confidently for you. We just pray, Lord, for anybody here who is struggling, who has issues that, that they're trying to work through. We pray, God, that you would work miracles in their life, bring peace to them. We ask more importantly, God, that through your son, Jesus, each of us would come to you asking for forgiveness and being all set when it comes to the end of time. We pray this in your name. Amen.